Our first speaker is Ryan Davis. Uh, and Ryan has a PhD in Hebrew Bible and Ancient Near East from the University of Texas at Austin. He focuses on understanding ancient Israel and Judah in its ancient cultural context. He is currently interested in understanding ritual specialists and their rituals in both Israel and in cuneiform cultures. Ryan currently teaches in the, as an adjunct faculty in Ancient Scripture at BYU. One thing he enjoys about his research is being able to request books entitled Evil Demons or books about anti-witchcraft rituals. Thank you very much, Ryan. Okay, I feel like I'm in the spotlight, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks for attending. So comparison is at the heart of understanding the world around us. In fact, the father of modern linguistics, Ferdinand de Saussure, has shown that meaning is created through difference. It is only when we recognize difference that meaning emerges. Or as Lehi put it, it must needs be that there is an opposition or an opposite in all things. If something does not have an opposite or something to contrast with, then all things must needs be a compound in one. Thus, in order to fully appreciate something, we have to see something that it is not. The prince, this principle is perhaps most simply demonstrated when we go abroad and then return home. Our home has not changed, but often we see it with new eyes. This is the basic idea of the hero's journey, but is also the premise of comparative scholarship. In going to the past, we hope to not only experience a different world, but we hope that the world, that world, will change how we see our own. Today, I want to metaphorically take us to a Thanksgiving offering in ancient Israel. I want to use this opportunity to see our own modern Latter-day Saint testimony meetings in a new way. Both of these rituals include public declarations about God before a covenant community, and both include ritual meals that strengthen relationships with God and other members of the covenant community. My hope is that as we see the similarities and differences between these two ancient and modern rituals, we can more fully appreciate modern fast and testimony meeting as well as ancient Israelite temple worship. Understanding Israel's own cultural context will help us better understand the Thanksgiving offering. In, ancient, in the ancient Near East, people interacted with their gods in a relationship cycle that could be divided into three parts. First, there was the cry for help. You called the gods when you needed help. Then there was the God's act of deliverance. And lastly, there was the act of blessing or thanksgiving in return. You can find this relationship cycle in many ancient inscriptions found among Israel's neighbors during the biblical period. For example, the Zakur Stili tells of an Aramean king named Zakur who was besieged by an enemy alliance. Zakur cries out to the god Baal Shemaim, The stele tells of how Baal Shemaim answered Zakur through prophets who told him to fear not, and it tells how Zakur was delivered from his enemies. The stele is itself the blessing or thanksgiving offered to the god Baal Shemaim for his act of deliverance. Just as praise worked to enhance the prestige of kings and rulers, the praise of the delivered would enhance the prestige of the gods. This same practice and relationship cycle is also found in ancient Israel. For example, in 1 Samuel 7, it tells the story of Samuel asking Jehovah for help against the Philistines. Jehovah answers by giving Israel victory. And then Samuel sets up a monument called Eben Ezer, or Stone of Help. Just like Zachary Stili that, prom that praised and brought glory to Baal Shemaim, Samuel's monument was meant to immortalize and remember Jehovah's act of deliverance in their battle with the Philistines. 
although each part of this relationship cycle could and did take place outside of the temple in ancient Israel, many of the temple rituals of ancient Israel revolved around this cyclical pattern of interacting and relating with Jehovah. This last part of this relationship cycle was carried out and enacted in the temple through the Thanksgiving offering. This ritual carried out in the temple was carried out in the temple after you had cried to Jehovah for help and he had answered your prayer. The one who had experienced Jehovah's help or deliverance came to the temple intending to render to Jehovah a blessing, both in word and in deed. The two main elements of this ritual include a psalm of thanksgiving and then a celebratory sacrifice or a celebratory meal. Now that we have the context, let's talk about the thanksgiving psalm compared to Latter-day Saint testimonies. What we know about the actual thanksgiving offered in the temple is based on the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a carefully curated collection of prayers and poems, many of which were sung and performed in the temple. The headings of the Psalms themselves indicate that the Levites were involved in their performance. Among the Psalms are examples of the Thanksgiving Psalms. These Psalms follow the same format as the Zakur Stili. They tell of the plight that the worshiper found themselves in how Jehovah answered them. And they offer thanks and blessing to Jehovah for what he had done. And they encourage others to trust in Jehovah. In this sense, thanksgiving in the Old Testament was always about relationships, particularly a relationship with Jehovah. This thanksgiving was not a private practice. It took place in the temple before the covenant community. So that when one went to the temple, regardless of the reason, one might be confronted with thanksgiving, encouraging all in the temple to trust Jehovah and his faithfulness in answering prayers. Talking about a similar practice in Mesopotamian prayers, Tzvi Abush once said that the thanksgiving expressed in relational terms is a statement of personal allegiance that is intended to draw others to the service of God. In the same way, the expression of thanksgiving in the Jerusalem temple allowed the individual to declare Jehovah as their God and to encourage others to trust Jehovah as well. This focus on a relationship with Jehovah worked toward achieving the goal of Jehovah's covenant relationship with Israel as a whole. Jehovah's relationship with Israel was meant to bless the entire world, and they could only do this by showing the world what could be accomplished when Israel and Jehovah worked together. The covenant with Israel was centered on a relationship. Both to Abraham and to Israel, Jehovah covenanted that he would be a God to them. They would be his people. This covenant was binding and exclusive. Jehovah was a jealous God. Once you began to worship him, he demanded complete fidelity and he promised the same in return. All those who worship Jehovah would have to come through Israel, or in other words, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed by Israel. Although this broader national covenant served as backdrop, the Thanksgiving offering was focused on individuals and families. Because the individual had trusted and relied on Jehovah, Jehovah had delivered them, they could now claim that Jehovah was their God. The public declaration of one's relationship with Jehovah has broad similarities to the Latter-day, to Latter-day Saint testimonies born in fast and testimony meeting. Um, testimonies are themselves public declarations about God within a covenant community. However, unlike Thanksgiving Psalms, testimonies are often centered on facts and truths. Assertions are common, such as, I know that God lives, I know that the church is true, and I know the Book of Mormon is true. These statements, in some ways, fulfill the same purpose that we have noticed for the Thanksgiving Psalms. They allow worshipers of God to publicly identify themselves and encourage others to have faith and to obtain their own testimonies of truth. 
testimony, similar to the Thanksgiving Psalms, is considered, considered to be one of the primary ways that we turn others toward God and Jesus Christ. Even though testimonies and Thanksgiving Psalms, even though testimonies and Thanksgiving Psalms serve similar purposes, they do so in very different ways. Much of it has to do with their differing cultural contexts. The Thanksgiving Psalms were focused on a relationship with Jehovah, whereas here the emphasis is on knowing truths or facts. Truth as a category was certainly operative in the Old Testament, but truth is often better translated as faithfulness. In the Old Testament, Jehovah was a true God because he kept promises. He was loyal and true. The importance of truth for us as Latter-day Saints undoubtedly has many causes. One of them is the Enlightenment, with this emphasis that truth was something out there to be discovered by human reason, and the truth was positive and always to be embraced. One of the truths that has become of paramount importance to those who live a life of faith is the existence of God. Hence the testimony, I know that God lives. In our culture, the mere existence of God is no longer taken as a given. The search for truth during the Enlightenment also created another way of thinking about the world, a way that did not need to include God. In ancient Israel, on the other hand, atheism was never an issue. Of course, gods existed. Their world was filled with temples and gods. The relevant question for the Israelites and the cultures around them was not whether God exists, but rather which God, if worshiped, will come through for me. In this sense, faith was not in the existence of gods, but in their faithfulness in helping individuals who trusted in their care. The Latter-day Saint search for truth, however, at a much deeper level, mirrors the emphasis on relationship that is found in the Old Testament. When Latter-day Saints testify of truths they have found, this comes after a very similar relationship cycle. They asked God for help, received an answer, and now proclaim it. The difference is that for the Old Testament saints, this was not a fact learned so much as a relationship gained. Something else that is distinctive about testimony meeting is that a testimony of God in the Book of Mormon could be born even before one knows. President Packer often said that, quote, a testimony is found in the bearing of it. In this way, declaring these truths could be an act of faith in the same way that the father of a sick child in the New Testament could say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. However, the Thanksgiving Psalms could not be performed by someone who had not experienced Jehovah's saving power. It was only someone who had been lifted out of their troubles that could proclaim with experience that Jehovah was their God and faithful to his covenants. Our Latter-day Saint testimonies in this regard seem to pull from the beginning of the relationship cycle, the cry for help. In this part of the cycle, it was common for Israelites to assert that Jehovah was their God, that he would hear their prayers and save the individual. This was done on faith and without a certain knowledge. In this way, despite the common statement that we know, we are actually declaring a faith that looks forward to future confirmation and future deliverance. In this way, we hope to be delivered out of the afflictions of, and trials of doubt and uncertainty by declaring that we hope, by declaring what we hope to experience in the future. The Thanksgiving ritual consisted of both the Thanksgiving Psalm and the sacrificial meal, just as a fast and testimony consisted of both testimonies and the sacrament. Not only would those in the temple hear the Thanksgiving Psalms of the delivered, but a sacrifice was brought by the delivered individual, and this sacrifice was to be eaten with members of the covenant community. It probably looked a little bit different than Thanksgiving dinner, but it looked nice, right? Um, Deuteronomy tells us that the sacrifices were to be brought to the temple to rejoice before Jehovah with a group consisting of you and your sons, your daughters, your male servants and female servants, and the Levites in your gates. 
This celebratory group may have been even more inclusive, possibly including the poor and vulnerable members of society. The people who shared the meal were a subset of God's people who had a personal relationship with the individual whom God had saved. This was not an everyday meal, but a meal that was eaten before the Lord in his presence. Jehovah participated in the meal since the fat was placed on the altar and the remainder of the animal was eaten by the saved individual together with his or her friends and family. Because it was eaten in Jehovah's presence, those who came to the meal had to be ritually pure. They had to make sure they had prepared. Failure to do so would lead the infracting individual to be cut off from the people. This meal commemorated what God had done for an individual, but it also served to bind the community that surrounded the individual, in addition to also binding each worshiper to Jehovah. Meals in most cultures form relationships of varying degrees of formality. This was an assumed part of sacrifices and rituals that accompanied them. When Israel was in the wilderness, they were condemned for being bound to the god Baal Peor because they attended his sacrifices and ate meals with his community. Although Israelites in the community were essentially born in the covenant, to use a modern Latter-day Saint term, to participate in the Thanksgiving meal was to reaffirm their relationship with Jehovah, and it reaffirmed their status among his people by eating a meal together. Similar to the Thanksgiving offerings and its accompanying meal, fast and testimony meeting also includes a communal meal eaten among members of a covenant community who commemorate an act of deliverance. Those taking part in this meal are also expected to be spiritually prepared in order to participate in the meal. If we are not properly prepared, the Book of Mormon says that we eat and drink damnation to our souls. Those that participate in the meal are members of a ward, or saints, that live together in a covenant community. The meal, which is called the sacrament, is a commemoration of a singular act of deliverance. This act of deliverance, the death of Jesus Christ, brings the community together. Unlike the Thanksgiving offering, which commemorates an individual or family level act of deliverance, the sacrament functions more to commemorate the deliverance of an entire people on the scale of the Exodus. It is not surprising then that Jesus institutes the sacrament during the Passover, itself a commemoration of this deliverance, or that Luke makes reference to Christ's sacrifice as a new covenant, evoking Jeremiah looking forward to an event that would rival and exceed Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Yet Christ's act of deliverance was more than remembered. It was an act of deliverance that keeps on delivering. The saints come together to remember what Jesus had done for them, but participating in the meal allows the deliverance to take place. Thus, Latter-day Saints, in acknowledging this great act of deliverance, both commemorate how this act has delivered them individually and how it will continue to deliver them every week. The sacrament is a meal that formally renews a covenant with Jesus Christ. Those who eat and drink witness that they are willing to keep his commandments, take his name upon them, and always remember him. In scriptural language, taking a God's name meant to belong to that God and to be his people. Those taking part in the meal are witnessing that they are in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul drew on the imagery of ritual meals in the temple when he talked about the sacrament in 1 Corinthians 10. Paul taught that the sacrament unites us and brings fellowship with Christ, whereas eating sacrifices offered to other gods brings fellowship with devils. As noted by Paul, the sacramental meal is shared together and eaten, is shared and eaten together as a covenant community. The covenant includes not only an obligation to God, but to each other. As Alma taught, the covenant community agrees to mourn with those who mourn, to comfort those who stand in need of comfort, and to bear one another's burdens. 
Therefore, as Latter-day Saints eat and drink the ritual meal of the sacrament, they are promising to bear the burdens of those sitting in the pews right next to them. The promise that comes with this covenant is that we will always have his spirit to be with us. So in a real way, properly participating in this meal is a promise that not only during the meal itself, but also, but always afterwards, we will stand in the presence of God. The Old Testament ritual was done in the temple, Jehovah's earthly residence, but the sacrament meal was eaten in church. This meal also comes with a promise that he will continue to dwell with his people regardless of where they reside. Time, unfortunately, prevents us from doing a more thorough explanation, but I hope that it has become clear that Latter-day Saints participate in, as they participate in fast and testimony meetings, they also participate in many aspects of the ancient Israelite temple ritual of the Thanksgiving offering. Comparing them gives us an appreciation that both involved proclaiming their allegiance to God in front of a covenant community with the larger goal of winning more people to the covenant. Both involve a meal that commemorates an act of deliverance, a meal that not only renews a relationship with God, but also strengthens communal ties. The, difference, the differences help orient us just as much as the similarities. The Thanksgiving offering was performed as part of a relationship cycle, one that required thanks for deliverance, and the relationship and the cycle that strengthens it were front and center during the Thanksgiving psalm. In testimony meeting, more emphasis is placed on truth and facts that God has revealed. This revelation may, may very well have been the result of a similar relationship cycle, but it is the knowledge gained that is highlighted rather than the process. The meal itself in the Thanksgiving offering was an occasional commemoration of an act of deliverance on the level of a single individual or family, whereas the sacrament was an act of deliverance on a larger scale that is commemorated weekly. Both meals bring us into the presence of the Lord and recommit individuals and communities to sustain an ongoing and saving relationship with God. I, for one, have personally benefited from better understanding the emphasis that ancient Israelite culture has placed on having a relationship with deity. It has helped me better participate in testimony meeting, and it has helped me feel a greater kinship with the saints of ancient Israel. Thank you. Questions? Yes? I think we have a mic that's going around here. Um, do you find that um, the, the same pattern is consistent in, in talking about maintaining behavior in ancient history throughout the different temples through the, the course of history? That's a really good question. Um, I mostly focus on um, First Temple, but even that's problematic because a lot of what we know about the First Temple is sometimes extrapolated from what was happening in the Second. Um, they were obviously um, carrying out sacrifices uh, very similar um, up until the end of the temple. Exactly the nuts and bolts of, of how it happened and played out, I'm sure, changed in each time. But the general idea, I think, for the sacrifices has stayed the same. I find it really interesting that uh, Hebrew for the thank offering, Yada, Toda, um, also, he changed the mouse a little, is to know. So it's an interesting connection then between lifting your hands in thanks and what we do today in saying, I know. Mm. Um, have you done any work with that, the linguistic? Part of this? Yeah, thank you for your comment. I mean, one thing that I think is very interesting um, is that, yeah, the, the verb yada, um, yod, uh, dalet, ein, 
is, is a very, it's a fun word in, in uh, biblical Hebrew. And, and when they usually use the term to know, they're, they're using it more, less in the sense that I know a fact, but I, I know somebody. I have a relationship with that person. And, and, that's, and that's a fun thing. I think that, that for the Israelites, the important thing was not just to know about Jehovah. Like, yeah, I heard about the guy, right? But it was actually to have a real relationship with him. And, and that was what would save them. I think we had a comment down here. Thank you. Uh, so based on what you're telling us today, how do we improve our testimony there? Well, good. So I, I can move from being uh, uh, writing a descriptive paper and move toward telling us what we should be doing. I, I myself have found um, it very enriching to, to think about, because as Latter-day Saints, we don't necessarily believe that testimony saves us, right? You know, when you're there at the, at the end, we believe that it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that will actually save us rather than our testimony. And, and so I, I think that one thing that the, the Old Testament Thanksgiving Psalm has kind of helped me think about is, is do I really trust God, right? Or, or are we too caught up and worried about whether he exists that we forget that we need to start trusting him? And that's what the the Israelite saints were worried about was, was putting your trust in God and him coming through for you rather than they weren't so worried about whether he was existing or not. That's some two cents, but. One last question. Can you, just, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. No. You remind me of something when you talk about the ritual meal. Uh, many years ago, I was a young student at Columbia University and I audited a class from Theodore Gaster, noted the Jewish scholar, and he was talking about the religions in the Middle East and how they were similar, and certainly all of them were similar in all of them. One was a ritual meal. And he says, I would illustrate that with our English word companion. He says that a Latin root means pan or bread. So literally a companion is one with whom you eat bread. Hmm. And I immediately thought of the passage in DNC which says, the Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion. Hmm. You know, I, the Lord chose that word there, and it goes along with the idea that they always have that spirit to be with them. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, just the fact that thinking about Jehovah participating in the meal with the covenant community is, is a fun idea that... He's not just looking on, but he's himself a participant.